529, let's stand together as we sing and begin. There shall be showers of blessing, 529. Uh, there shall be showers of blessing, in the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing, sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops from the surface. Showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance of rain. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. On the fourth stanza of the last, there shall be showers of blessing, oh, that today they might fall. Now as to God of confessing, now unto Jesus we call. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and after that, we'll go some announcements. You can have a seat after prayer. Father, we come to you tonight. Lord, much to pray about. There always is, but we're thankful, Lord, that you are able. You are the great I am. None of these requests are unknown to you, Lord, and we're thankful for your power, your majesty, your faithfulness, your goodness. Lord, the fact that we, as your children, through Jesus Christ... And the finished work on the cross and the blood of Christ, Lord, allows us to have access to you. Lord, I'm thankful we don't have to go through another person, a priest, uh, someone that's a religious leader. But Lord, as a child of God, we can come directly to the throne of grace at any time, provided, Lord, we're right with you and bring our petitions before you. Lord, we know that you love us and you've asked us to do that. Lord, tonight we do remember several in our church family, Barb and Dennis, Lord, battling sickness, Lord, immune system. Strengthen them, Lord, I pray. Let them not be weary or discouraged. And I pray they'd be take a step of uh, direction to good health, even, Lord, tonight, tomorrow. Barbara Kyle and her family, Lord, been battling that similar thing. I pray, Lord, that could pass through there. They'd be okay. Get back on their feet there, Lord, and back to work and school and such. Lord, we certainly want to remember Wendy as she's on a mission trip there with Mercy Mission and Lord Medical, and I pray that she continue to be safe, protected. Uh, Lord, use her and the other doctors and nurses in a great way there, Lord, not just to, uh, to bring physical relief and healing because of medical, but Lord, because of the gospel and sharing Christ. And Lord, we pray there be much fruit that remains because of that. Lord, others in our church family, remember Bethany, Lord, some of the tests being run. Uh, I pray they'd be able to know what may be causing this, Lord, be able to treat that and heal it. We think of Sam Harris, his brother, Lord, uh, Levi, and some of the unexpected news that, uh, news that he received. Receive, Lord, about this tumor that looks to be cancerous, Lord. And Lord, I know that's really been a blow to his family, Lord. They're saved. They trust you. But yet, Lord, hard to process that. So I pray for your uh, strength and grace for them, Lord, in the days ahead as uh, decisions being made and tests being run. Lord, others I know I'm forgetting, some of the ones I mentioned, our missionary, Lord, uh, Leanne Comstock there recovering from gallbladder surgery, uh, Jackie as well, Lord, still recovering from that. Lord, many others I know I'll forget by name. Uh, Lord, I pray we'd be faithful in lifting up those names to you, uh, sending a card, an email, a text message, dropping by to visit, a meal. Lord, however you lay on our hearts, Lord, may we act accordingly. We ask your blessing now on this service, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's take our hymn books. We'll remain seated. 371, 371, A Passion for Thee. 371, both stanzas. Set my heart, oh dear Father, on Thee and Thee.
Thank you, Kelly. At this time, instead of the um, retreat testimonies this time, we're actually going to sing that last song listed, 415 instead. So we're going to sing, Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. We'll take our hymn book, and uh, let's go ahead and stand once again, if we will. Now, I know I have some, a good number of choir members here. If we have some sopranos want to take those high notes on the hallelujahs, so that'll make it for a nice rendition of Seek Ye First. Now, let's go ahead and sing both stanzas. Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God and His Righteousness. Oh. Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God and His Righteousness. This time we have special music before the message. Sound the battle cry, see the foe is nigh, raise a standard high for the Lord. Get your armor on, stand firm, everyone. Rest your cause upon his holy word. We are marching in the army, the army of the Lord. God has given us his armor and given us his sword. It's a life of high adventure and challenge every day. Self-control, that's our goal, marching for the Lord. Strong to meet the foe, marching on we go. While our cause we know must prevail. Bright gleaming in the light, battling for the right we ne'er can fail. We are marching in the army, engaging in the fight. We are following our captain, the victory is in sight. Jesus sounds a different drumbeat, the world can never hear. Giving strength to each rank. Marching for the Lord, O Thou God of all, hear us when we call, help us one and all by Thy grace. When the battle's done and the victory's won, may we wear the crown before Thy face. Rouse then, soldiers, rally round the banner, ready, steady. Pass the word along, onward, forward, shout the love of Santa, Christ is captain of the mighty throne, marching for the Lord. All right, amen. Thank you, man. Thank you, uh, orchestra, all the musicians, pianists, organists tonight. Appreciate that music. I'm going to dismiss it this time. Our Tykes for Truth. We have several here, I think, for that in that age group. We'll let them slip on out. Don't forget, if you didn't pick up a copy or two of our 2024 church theme, there's lots of those little postcards around. Hope you'll grab one. You can have one per person in your family, the children, whatever. Uh, have those. We've got plenty of extras. We'd love to have those used up for a good cause. All right, tonight you're going to be in two spots. You're going to be right toward the front of your Bible and right at the back of your Bible, all right? So the book of Jude is where we're at toward the back of your Bible, that you know. And then Genesis chapter 5 in the front of your Bible. So both are pretty easy to find. Genesis 5, just a few pages in the front. And Jude, just a few pages at the back, depending on what kind of Bible you have. If you have a study Bible with additional help, so you'll have lots of pages between the cover and the book of Jude. 
All right, glad again to have you out here tonight, continuing our study in the book of Jude. And uh, you're going to be, again, Genesis 5. You don't have to necessarily keep everything open. You could put a bookmark, pencil there, your bulletin. Uh, we're going to look at that here in just a second. We'll start in the book of Jude, though, tonight. We'll start in the book of Jude, and then we'll get to Genesis briefly, all right? All right, tonight... I was going to, originally was going to push on ahead a little bit here. I, I covered the last time we were here on Sunday night. We looked at verses 14, 15, and 16. And I was going to press ahead here and get started on 17 and 18, 19, as we're getting toward the conclusion. But the Lord uh, put a break on that. So we're going to actually go back a little bit and continue looking at what we did last time, primarily verses 14 and 15. All right. And uh, I'll let you know exactly what we're covering and why we're doing that tonight. I think it'll be helpful to you. I hope it will be. And hopefully you'll leave here tonight growing in some knowledge of the Word of God and some application. So, book of Jude, let's, let's just read for context sake, verses 11 through 16. Let's read 11 through 16. Remember when you see the word these, these in the book of Jude, it's talking about apostates, false teachers, false prophets. When you see them or these, so keep that in mind, you'll see that several times, all right? So, Bibles are open, the book of Jude. We're going to pick it up in verse 11. We'll read through verse 16, I'll have a brief word of prayer, and then we're going to jump into God's word tonight. The Bible reads, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feasts of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Now, if you remember, we have these illustrations all pictures of something that looks like there should be substance, but are empty when you investigate. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also. The seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all their ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage, because of profit. These, 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 woe unto them. Tonight, though, I'd like to draw our attention primarily to verses 14 and 15. And the title tonight's a little unusual if you're taking notes. Uh, Jude... Enoch, and so-called lost books of the Bible. All right, we're going to look at that tonight. Jude, Enoch, and so-called lost books of the Bible. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I pray now as we look in your word tonight, Lord, I pray we'd have confidence in the word of God. I pray we'd believe in the inspiration, inerrancy, infallibility, preservation of the word of God, Lord, that it is sufficient and that it is complete and sealed and preserved for us today. Lord, I thank you for your word. We know that the Bible has always been under attack, Lord, even in Genesis 3. When the devil said, yea, hath God said. Lord, we have warning after warning in the scripture not to add or to subtract or to diminish the words of God. But to protect and to guard, to live and to walk and to pass on and to contend for it. Lord, I pray you would help us as a church body and as each believer here to love the word of God. To be able to trust it, Lord, to have no doubt about it. And, Lord, to be people of the book, I pray. Now, guide and speak through me, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jude, Enoch, and so-called lost books of the Bible. Here's some questions I want to answer tonight. All right. Uh, did Jude here in verses 14 and 15, is he quoting from a so-called book of Enoch? All right, a lost book or a hidden book or a so-called could be book of the Bible that is not in the Bible. Is Jude quoting from the book of Enoch? 
What is the book of Enoch? And what are these so-called lost books? Some will have knowledge of that. Others will say, I don't know what you're talking about. All right. Uh, can we trust that what I hold in my hands and hopefully in your hand, and of course we have here an English translation of the Word of God, the King James Version. Can I trust what we, I have and what you have? That it is the inspired, God-breathed Word of God. Inerrant, without any errors, contradictions, mistakes in any way. Completely trustworthy in every facet, every word, every letter, completely inspired of God, preserved, and that what we have today is the Word of God. And there's nothing missing, nothing lost, nothing that should be in here, despite so-called scholars, uh, theologians, or every so often a book that is discovered that should be in the Word of God or causes doubt. So we're going to look at that a little bit here tonight. And uh, you say, well, why is that? Well, because there are many, many who claim that when Jude here is writing verses 14 and 15, that he is quoting the book of Enoch, a so-called lost or hidden book. Ha! And is not necessarily uh, inspired of God or that he's simply copying something that was in another book. So I want to use that as a jumping off point because uh, there are many, unfortunately, but we should expect that, right? What else? Well, if you, if you and I were the enemy, what would we do to corrupt the word of God? Uh, what would we do to try to cast doubt? Would we try to eliminate it? Sure. All right. Would we try to uh, get rid of every one of them if possible? Absolutely. Would we try to cast doubt on it? Sure. Would uh, we try to diminish it, uh, subtract from it, add to it, change it? All right, absolutely. Uh, would we try to forge letters and books and things that are claiming to be? The, of course, I would think so. And so it should not surprise us that there have been many attacks and will continue to be many upon the Word of God. And one of them is in the area of lost books, so-called hidden books of the Bible that cast doubt on, well, how do we know that the 66 here are enough? How do we know there aren't some missing? How do we know that the 66 are even all of God? Who, after all, came up with that? You know, and those kind of questions that can cast doubt very much like, yea, hath God said, hath God said. So I want to look at that a little bit tonight again. For some, this will be old study for you. You've looked at this, you've studied this, you uh, on your own through messages, Dr. Cremard, other speakers, uh, through college. For some, though, it may be brand new to you here a little bit tonight. So, the book of Enoch is a so-called book. You can order it on Amazon. There's people that do. Uh, they make movies and so-called uh, you know, documentaries on it. I've had, I've had people ask me about it, no doubt about it. All right? And uh, I've, I've, in fact, one of the great reasons that Christian education is great, uh, I, I, I used to teach, uh, there's a curriculum, uh, Proteins, Positive Action for Christ. Most of our Bible classes in our school were from there. And in 7th and 8th grade, uh, I have the book in my office. Every two years, we'd study a dynamic Christian living. And and one of the sections on there was the Bible. And believe it or not, 7th and 8th graders in that. I can show you in my office tonight. All right. One of the chapters deals with the Apocrypha, hidden and lost books. What is that? Why do we not? Why do we reject those? What do we believe? I mean, 7th and 8th graders learning about inspiration, preservation, canon of Scripture. All right. A tremendous love teaching that in a Christian school setting, not just waiting to get to college. All right. So you might say, well, I, I don't know what those words are. Those are big words. I don't know what you're talking about. I have no doubt. Out. And now, Pastor Boyer, you put this in my mind. Maybe now I'm going to start searching. All right. Uh, well, that doesn't cause me to, to ignore that. All right. But there are so-called lost books or hidden books. The book of Enoch, uh, the, the gospel of Thomas, uh, the gospel of Judas. All right. Uh, the gospel of Peter, the epistle of Barnabas. All right. Epistles of Paul, not in the scriptures. The gospel of Nicodemus. We could we could mention many. Uh, that creep up every now and then, so-called being discovered. And then as you read those, ah, it looks like it contradicts the word of God that we have. Or there's some information we didn't know or cast doubt on the deity of Christ or God's character. And oh my goodness. And then there are many who uh, are ignorant or weak that sometimes that can pull them astray. And so obviously here, this is an important question. You know, is Jude as a prophet, as a writer of the scriptures, 
Is he quoting from a, what we would say, maybe a heretical book here, something that's false? You know, why would he do that? Or, or is he not? How do we know? Because many will claim, if you read commentaries and even just search that, uh, probably the large majority will say, yes, he's just quoting here from that. And even from verse 9, some will say he's claiming, quoting from another source, where we don't know anything about Michael the archangel uh, fighting over the devil with the devil about the body of Moses. That must be from some other lost or hidden book. And so how do we know that everything in the Bible is true. All right. Well, I want to talk about that a little bit here tonight. Make sure you understand what we're talking about here. And again, tying in with trusting the word of God that we have. Trusting the word of God that we have. So uh, some of you probably have. You may have a, a Bible at home. Certainly if you're from a Catholic background and you were raised with this, you may still have a Catholic Bible. You may have a Bible that has what's called the Apocrypha. How many have a Bible at home that has the Apocrypha in it? Anybody? Uh, if you have a Catholic Bible, Catholic Bibles will have the Apocrypha. Okay, just a handful. I've got three here. I have in my office a whole shelf of Bibles over the years. I'll go to thrift stores. I'll just get them for examples when preaching and teaching on Bible versions and translations. It's good to have all of those out there. So if you go in there, you'll see all kind of ones. All right. I don't hold to those. I don't read those. Most of them, but they're just, I've got Masonic Lodge ones, uh, Catholic, you know, different ones. And so over the years, I've picked up some of these. I used to bring them into my Bible class when teaching seventh and eighth graders, because they had no idea what the Apocrypha was. And I'd say, here, you come up and look at these. And so I have three different versions here that have the Apocrypha. This is the uh, first one is the Holy Bible uh, with the Apocrypha, the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, here's another one, the New English. Bible with the Apocrypha. And then here's another one, uh, the New Oxford Annotated Bible, New Revised Standard Version with the Apocrypha College Edition, an ecumenical study Bible, all right? Ugh, that's a scary way a little bit, I hope, all right? But you've got all of those there, and then you have in those the Apocrypha. Now, if you're not familiar with those, I'll leave them here in the front. You can go look, all right? And so in the middle here, typically is packed in there around the minor prophets, somewhere between the minor prophets and the book of Matthew, will be in these Bibles, and what used to be all the time Catholic Bibles, all right, and a section called the Apocrypha. Now, the word Apocrypha means hidden things, all right, uh, but you can see there are those that include them in the Bible. I mean, if you just someone gave you this as a new Christian, how would you know? What would you say? Oh, I got the word of God. Oh, great. I'm reading here and I'm reading in here and I'm coming through Joel, Joel and Amos and, and all of a sudden, boom. All right. Here, well, what are these books? All right. And I begin to read. And here, here are uh, 14 books in this Bible. 14. All right. So that's that's a total. What is that there? That's 80 or 68 or yeah, seven. What am I getting? Seven, 80. Right. Am I getting my math right here? 66. Yeah, I'm doing a quick up here. You're like, wait a minute. The first and second book of Esdras, Tobit, Judith, the rest of the chapters of the book of Esther. These are all book titles. The wisdom of Solomon, the wisdom of Jesus or Jesus, son of Syrac, Baruch, a letter of Jeremiah, the song of the three, Daniel and Susanna, Daniel, Bell and the snake, the prayer of Manassas, the first and second book of the Maccabees. You're like, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Some of you are like, what? The dragon. All right. You hear some of these. You're like, what does that mean? But, but here they're included in certain versions of the Bible as books of the Bible. All right. And so the Apocrypha means hidden books. And there are. And by the way, that is part of Catholic dogma. I hope you understand that. Let me read from the Catholic uh, doctrines here. Uh, two sections of this. You may, if you come from that background, have been saved at it, may remember this. You may not. So if. Catholic traditions, this comes from the Dogmatic Constitutional and Divine Revelation, chapters 2 and 9, page 682. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture, then, are bound closely together, this is Catholic doctrine, and communicate one with the other. So tradition and scripture. For both of them, flowing out from the same divine wellspring, come together in some fashion to form one thing and move toward the same goal. Thus it comes about the church does not draw her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. Hence, both Scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal feelings of devotion and reverence. Hope I didn't lose you on that. But both sacred tradition as well as some of the leaders, the Pope and others, is equal to, if not superior to, the Bible. And we need to take, well, okay, you say, well, that doesn't deal with the Apocrypha. You're right, but let me go on a little bit here. If you're familiar with what was the Council of Trent, all right, that was a Catholic council held in the 1500s. 
They were trying to destroy the progress of the Protestant Reformation, and the Catholic Church has never renounced that, and they still hold to that Council of Trent. So this is their beliefs and their dogma. If you've never read it, the Council of Trent hurled 125 eternal damnations against Bible-believing Christians. I'm just going to read you one or two of them. The fourth one, decree concerning the canonical scriptures. If anyone does not accept as sacred and canonical of the aforesaid books in their entirety and with all of their parts, the 66 books of the Bible plus 12 apocryphal books, being two of this, two of Ezra's and ones I named, as they have been accustomed to be read in the Catholic Church and as they are contained in the old Latin Vulgate edition and knowingly and deliberately rejects these aforesaid traditions, let him be anathema. So Catholic dogma says that you include, they're in there and you, they are the word of God. And if anyone says not, let them be damned. All right. If you've never read the 125 that they still hold to today, uh, it could shock you a little bit. I'll just give you one other example in, on baptism. Seventh session. If anyone says that baptism is optional, that is not necessary for salvation, let him be anathema. If anyone says that children, because they have not the act of believing, are not after having received baptism to be numbered among the faithful, and that for this reason are to be rebaptized when they have reached the years of discretion, or that it is better that the baptism of such be omitted than that while not believing by their own act, they should be baptized in the faith of the Roman church alone. Let him be anathema. Now, if you've never read any of those 125 at the Council of Trent, which they still hold to today, it will probably shock you. On all of the areas of which they say is Catholic doctrine and truth, the only true church. And if you do not believe that, let him be anathema damned. Whoa! So be careful uh, when dealing with Catholic. It doesn't mean there aren't good people. It doesn't mean there's people that don't believe all of those things. But most have not broken away, perhaps, from those. So I say all that to say this. And to give you the examples here, uh, that the Catholics still hold to the Apocrypha as being inspired of God, included in the majority of their Bibles, and as part of their doctrine, and that it is the inspired Word of God. So, you know, that brings us then to what about here in Scripture, uh, when sometimes we get uh, Bible authors, inspired of God, quoting, well, we don't know where it's from. Does that mean then they're, they're just quoting random secular you know, things and things like that. For instance, um, but we have to understand God. God is not obligated to reveal everything at one time, is he, through inspiration. For instance, who wrote the first five books of the Bible? Human author. Moses. Was Moses there at creation? Was Moses alive at all during the time period of Genesis? M M Moses, 2,500 years after. 2,500 years after uh, most everything that took place in the book of Genesis. And so how did he know? God revealed it to him. God revealed it to him, and God breathed it out, and Moses penned it down. All right? You know, Paul in 2 Timothy 3, 8, isn't that interesting? He names two names of the magicians. Like, what? We're not, nobody, Moses never named them. <laughs> Nobody knew any names of the magicians uh, that were duplicating some of those. But he, they're named in 2 Timothy. Now, who gave them that? Was Paul around? No. All right. Well, he's just, no, God gave those uh, under inspiration. In 2 Peter 2, 5, we looked at this last time. Peter calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. Now, we're never told that in the Bible. We could, we could say, well, I'm sure he did do some preaching and why he's building a boat. But the Bible says in Peter, which is thousands of years later, that he was a preacher of of righteousness. Hmm. God, well, God didn't tell us. God wasn't obligated to tell us that. You know? And here in the book of Jude, we have both a verse in verse 9 that we're never told of before, where there is a battle between Michael the archangel and the devil over the body of Moses. And Enoch, who knew that he was a prophet. We're never told anywhere in the Bible that he was a prophet. Or really, that he's the first man to utter a prophecy. Now, the first prophecy we would probably say is Genesis 3.15. That's uttered by the Lord in the garden, the, the promise of the coming Redeemer. That the first prophecy from God uttered by a man or a prophet was Enoch. But we don't know that. It's not told in Genesis. It's not told that in the, in the Hall of Faith. We're told that in the last, second to last book of the Bible. Under inspiration from God, dealing with apostasy, that Enoch, seventh from Adam, prophesied. Concerning the second coming of the Lord. 
It doesn't say he prophesied about the flood, though he may have. It doesn't say he was prophesying about a judgment back then, though he very likely did. It says that he prophesied in verse 14, The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. We looked at this last time. This is not referring to the flood, is it? Nope. Uh, this is not talking about the rapture either. He's talking about the second coming. Verse 15, to execute judgment. So I was reading an interesting uh, a preacher. He said, isn't that interesting? That the first prophecy and really the last prophecy, by and large, are, deal with judgment. Even though God is a God of grace and long suffering, The Lord's coming. And then what's the last one in the Bible? Or we could say, Christ, surely I come quickly. Now, when he says, surely I come quickly, what's he? He's not talking about the rapture. He's talking about his second coming where he brings judgment. All right. And so interesting as we look in the Bible here, how do we know that Enoch is a prophet? Well, hold your spot here. Let's go back very quickly again to Genesis chapter five. Genesis chapter five. We're going to come right back. To Jude, so hold your spot here. And again, I hope I'm not losing you and maybe a little bit deep at the beginning, but I want to uh, draw the net here on the, on the scriptures and the fact that we should be able to trust completely that our God, our great God, we have all we need in the Word of God. All right, Genesis chapter 5. Again, a little bit of review. We looked at this a couple weeks ago. So Genesis 5, again, is a genealogy from Adam. It's the godly seed. It's not every person. It's the godly seed. Uh, that's going to be the line of the Messiah. From this will come Noah, his son, Shem. From Shem comes Abraham. From Abraham, uh, the line of Christ. So we can trace the godly seed the whole way back. All right. And so Enoch is the seventh. We see in verse 19 that he was born. All right. Uh, his dad was Jared and talks about those kind of things. And then verse number 21, it says, And Enoch lived 60 and five years and begat Methuselah. Now, it doesn't mean that he never had any other children. It doesn't mean that Methuselah is the firstborn. He could have been. God doesn't record everything. We know he had other children because verse 22 says at the end he begat sons and daughters. So God's not always giving us everything, the exhaustive. He's giving us what's important, and that is the godly line. A lot of times it's not the oldest. All right. By the way, that's a pattern in the Bible for a reason. All right. That's a very interesting pattern if you study that one out. All right. So it says Enoch was 65 and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Now, we looked at that last time we went to Hebrews. And we looked in the hall of faith, Hebrews, and talks about he was translated. So when it says he was not or he was not found or he was translated, those are all pictures of a type of the rapture. He was called away. He was caught up. He was gone. All right. And uh, you have to put scripture with scripture to sort of see the entire picture here. Now, it doesn't mean that Enoch was a wicked man before Methuselah was born. He, he could have been. Well, sometimes we read into that. Sometimes we'll say, well, he walked with God after he might have been a good man. He might have been a God-fearing man. He just might not have really had that deep walk with God after Methuselah was born. And interesting enough, who named him? Well, almost all names in the Old Testament, especially in Genesis, have very important meanings. All right. Many times God names them or they have a very. So when you hear the name of the person, it, it carries great significance. So uh, did Enoch name his son? Did God come to him and tell him what to name his son? We could read into that. I couldn't prove it. But it is believed and I would hold to the fact that his son's name, Methuselah, there has the idea in it. When he is dead, it will come or when he dies, it shall be sent. So anytime he hears his son's name. Enoch thinks of that when he is dead or when he is gone, it will come or it will be here. I don't know all that was revealed to Enoch. I don't know what he knew or not. We're not told any of that, but there's a significance to that name. No doubt Enoch, much like Abraham, as a man who walked close to God, no doubt meditated and pondered upon these truths and even seeing the future in a way. Through God, right? I mean, if you study the life of Abraham, we, we, we spent several months on that last year on that. You look at that and the picture of, of Abraham and Sarah in their old age and miraculous birth, picturing Isaac as a type of Christ. 
And, and then the, the, the sacrifice on Mount Moriah, picturing the lamb that would be slain at the same. I mean, Abraham. And you, you tie in the scriptures on Abraham as he sees and begins to understand what God is showing and foretelling way down the road. The lamb that's going to come and a miraculous birth. You can see those same things here with Enoch. When he is dead, it shall come. What shall come, Lord? What is this? What is the significance of my son? Boy, that really jarred him. That really caused him to have a deeper, longer lasting walk with God. We would maybe infer a little bit here. He began to realize, boy, what is life? What is eternity? What's coming? When is it coming? What's the point of all the money and possessions that maybe was occupying my time? And something happened that Enoch began to walk ever so closer with the Lord. We know he was a prophet. We know he was proclaiming then this. We know he must have also, in a way, been a proclaimer of, of, of the news that he knew. And wow. Isn't it amazing then that the oldest man, the oldest person who ever lived was his son? 969 years. Is there a better picture of God's mercy, God's long suffering, God withholding that judgment that was coming? You know, it's not shown in the Bible, but tradition, Hebrew tradition says that Methuselah died seven days before the flood. If you read the book of Genesis, well, you're right here in Genesis. Why don't we just look at it? <laughs> Genesis 7, it's right there. And the Lord said unto Noah, verse 1, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. And look at verse 3, the 4. A lot of people forget this. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain. See, they were in the boat for a whole week with the door open. When he is dead, it shall come. 969 years old, on his deathbed, he dies, going to the ark. Seven days. It will be here. But there's one door. And all who want to enter can enter. Boy, I mean, Old Testament types. Things to be able to see that God was showing. Whoa. All right. Enoch, a prophet, prophesying. Now, again, you say, well, that is very interesting here. And, and all of this. What exactly, as we flip back to Jude, well, what exactly, though, does this prophecy mean? It did you, though, quote from the book of Enoch? I mean, it's not, we're never told this prophecy anywhere else. The book of Enoch does have a similar prophecy in it. A lot of the words are the same. But that all goes back then to your view of Scripture. And uh, hopefully you know the word hogwash, all right, that you have learned, or baloney, <laughs> <laughs> All right. And that you say, I don't even entertain that, uh, that he's copying something from another person. If you believe in the inspiration of the word of God, it comes down to this is God who's omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, immutable, unchanging, eternal, sovereign, the great I am, the creator, the almighty one, the only God. There is none else. If he's able to breathe out the words of scripture, which he did. And call holy men of God who were moved by the Holy Spirit to write that, which he did. Is he not able to protect and preserve and guard his word so that we have confidence in what we have? Or did, is God, like some people believe, our theologians act like God was old or he missed that or he would, didn't know that it would be attacked. And, and, and that, you know, is God not able then? To, so we have complete confidence in what we have so that you can tell people this is the word of God. This is the inspired word of God. I believe it. I hold to it. No doubt about it. There's nothing missing. There's nothing, subtra nothing subtracted. Well, how do we know? I mean, how do we know some people didn't just pick the wrong books that are in here? I mean, how do we know those things? Is, is God able? Is God going to let that go? Did we not look at what the very wording in book? Look at what does Jude say in verse number three? Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Read this last line with me. Everybody out loud. Which was once. See, as a teacher, you drop out to see who's reading. All right. Because if I'm reading, you'll I'll not hear you. So let's read that last line one more time. Which was once delivered unto the saints. That body of truth, we could say here in context, the New Testament faith, the New Testament scriptures, specifically all of the New Testament 27 books, but particularly the epistles uh, to the church. But all of it, it was once and for all, one time, completed and sealed and delivered to the saints. 
All right, now we know that Jude did not write the last books of the Bible. That was the Apostle John. He wrote the final five. In fact, it's believed that the Apostle John would have been probably the main leader as the last remaining apostle and disciple who would have helped compile the New Testament canoncy or 27 books. I mean, why would it not be John? All right, I realize he was on the island of Patmos, though some believe he was able to get off of that. But even then, uh, when it, we don't know when he wrote all of that there. Would he not have helped with that as, a, as the leader, of the ap ap apostolic leader in authority, to help say, these are the words of Scripture, uh, they're complete, they've been once delivered, and, and therefore help the, that early church, the first and sen second century church, we'd say, absolutely, absolutely, no doubt about that. So, question. And these so-called lost books are missing books, I've mentioned. All right. You know, what are they? Do, do we need to get afraid of those? Or are we scared of those? Uh, you may remember in, in Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul alludes to the fact that it appears that maybe somebody had forged a letter and put his name to it. Because he says, don't be shaken. Don't be talking about, talking about the rapture and some teachings on prophecy and, and second coming. And don't be shaken or nervous, believers. Uh, he, he alludes to the fact that even though it may be a letter from me, but it wasn't from me. I mean, how hard would it be just to write a letter and then sign Paul? <laughs> I mean, I could do that and you could do that. All right. Uh, I mean, how hard would it be for somebody to do that? Uh, you don't think the devil ever thought of that one? You don't think there was corrupted epistles and letters being passed around to dupe people? Of course. All right. And so uh, how do we have confidence in what we have in the word of God? Well, Second Timothy three sixteen and 17. Many of you memorize that and know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The source is God breathed and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Second Peter 1, 20, 21 lets us know exactly how God did that. Uh, the Holy Spirit moved. Holy men of God moved as they were moved by the Holy Spirit and the confidence that we have in all of those kind of things. So you say, well, well, what is this? So let me read an excellent article on did Joe Jude quote from the book of Enoch. This comes from uh, January 21st, article 2020 by David Cloud, Way of Literature. Did Jude quote from the book of Enoch? Now, I can't stand up here and say I've read the book of Enoch. I, I, I looked at a few parts, but a quick skim. All right. Many, though, who are, would be considered preachers, teachers, evangelical, theologian leaders would tell you that Jude absolutely is quoting from this book and that we may, not, we ha may have some missing books. But uh, here's some interesting things. First of all, uh, the book of Enoch is a lie from the beginning to the end. It is a hodgepodge of mythical writings about Enoch's supposed tour of heaven and hell during which he was led about by archangels and given extensive revelations. Despite the fact that Paul, who was taken to the third heaven, was commanded by God not to speak about it. Apparently, he said maybe Enoch was allowed to tell everything. He even reveals the names of archangels not mentioned in the Bible. Raphael, Suriel, and Uriel. The book of Enoch's full of wild-eyed tales such as 450-foot tall cannibal giants on the pre-flood earth. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil in heaven. The spirit of Abel suing Cain before God's throne. Angel watchers congregating on Mount Hermon. Angels teaching men how to make swords, shields, mirrors, and jewelry. And even disobedient stars in hell. Sound like a book of the Bible? The book of Enoch. Second, there is no sure evidence that the prophecy of Enoch in the book of Enoch even predates the apostles, despite people claiming how old it is. The book of Enoch, sometimes is made into three books, is actually composed of many different writings, and very little is even known about its history or who wrote it or where they came about. Some do predate perhaps the birth of Christ, but much of it was written later. There's much unknown about it. And third, church fathers meaning heretics such as Origen and Clement of Alexandria. Always avoid anything really that comes from Alexandria, for the most part, is pretty corrupt. Uh, they are the ones who pretty much began to give credence to that book and, by the way, the apocryphal books. There were no apocryphal books in any Bible until about the 400s, uh, which is about the beginning of Roman Catholicism, all right? That's why they're in most of their Bibles, all right? And so there is none. You say, well, interesting, okay, so uh, maybe that's not important, but what about the apocrypha? Now, I have read the apocrypha books, all right? Or I could say this, I have attempted the best I could, all right? If you've ever tried to read like the Book of Mormon, uh, it's like that. It's like poof, very hard, all right? Or, or even you tried to chew the Quran a little bit. And I don't mean chew it physically, but you tried to read it. 
It's like, whoa, all right? Uh, the Book of Mormon is very, it's all over the place, all right? If you've ever read the Apocrypha books or attempted to do those, very bizarre, all right? Uh, very unusual. And let me just give you a quick couple reasons here on, on why we as, uh, as believers, why the early church, church fathers, why we here would reject the Apocrypha books. Now, that doesn't mean that there are not things in that that could be true. Please understand that. I mean, don't, do you not read books? I mean, you read Christian books, you read Christian fiction, you read fiction, you read biographical history. That doesn't mean that they're all evil and wicked. It doesn't make it a book of the Bible, though. Doesn't mean that they're, doesn't mean that every single thing in them is false and evil and wicked. And it doesn't even mean that perhaps whoever wrote those was intending it for to, you know, to, to mislead anybody. But that through time and over time, someone or could be well-intended people, it could be enemies, Satan, whatever, got those to be in Included as if they are books of the Bible. Here are five reasons. You know what? These five reasons are the same five I just took right out of the 7th and 8th grade curriculum. All right? I'll give credit to proteins. All right? Because I still have the book and I went back and looked. All right? Here's the five that would be in the notes of Junior High Bible. Why we would reject the Apocrypha, which was introduced around the 400 ADs. First of all, there are errors and contradictions abundant. All right. The, the Apocrypha books themselves disagree with each other in many portions and even contradict one another. And there are open heresies in many of those. Number two, Jesus Christ never once quoted from any Apocrypha book or even alluded to it. Number three, no apostle ever quoted or alluded to any book of the Apocrypha. And number four, the Apocrypha books never once claimed to be inspired as scripture does repeatedly. And number five, the Apocrypha books were rejected by early church leaders very quickly and very easily. Not only that, they're very weak quality of literature and they never were accepted by early leaders. When I say church leaders, be careful now. I'm not talking about leaders in the three and four or five hundreds when you get up into Roman Catholicism. I'm talking about the early ones that are right after John passes away. Uh, the Polycarp, some of those that would have had first hand uh, encounter with them and would have been the early leaders of that first and century, second century church there, all right? So the Apocrypha really were introduced by what we would call heretics and apostates and were included in a lot of Bibles. Not so much today, so you might say, I don't know, I don't read them. But if you ever did try to read those, uh, all over, very difficult to read. They are not books of the Bible. Now, again, there are some historical things. The books of the Maccabees. Maccabees were true, real people. Many of you know the story of that, where Hanukkah came from. And they were going against, uh, again, some of the persecution there. And wow, I mean, the Maccabees were real people. All right. But it uh, doesn't mean that it's inspired books of the Bible that ought to be in the word of God. So that brings us back here to the book of Jude. And what I want to wrap up here in the next few moments. Well, how did we get the 66 books we have? And how do we know that these are the right 66? How do we know there shouldn't have been 64? Right? Like Esther and Song of Solomon, you know? You know, I mean, who said they should go in there, right? Esther doesn't even mention God. And, uh, you know, and you can read certain things that they're not, you know. How do we know that, uh, how do we have confidence? And what if there should have been a few others? And what if they have a new discovery that comes out and, and we find a, a hidden gospel that sounds good and tells us things? Well, uh, just keep in mind exactly how God did things when it comes to your Bible. Uh, four simple steps. Number one, the New Testament. I'm going to focus on the New Testament, though this would apply to all the Bible, but particularly the New Testament. Uh, the New Testament was written under inspiration. I hope you believe that. God breathed out every letter, every word. You say, well, well how do we know? Uh, flip back just a few pages here to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter number 3. 2 Peter 3. Okay, we can quote 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. But how do we know that, uh, you know, what that word scripture meant? Did they know what it meant back then? Is it really talking about the Bible? Well, notice 2 Peter, interesting verse. 2 Peter 3. Take a look at verses 15 and 16. Now, we don't have the exact date of when all the New Testament books are written. We can come pretty close. It is believed that Peter, who was an apostle and disciple, wrote this book uh, before Paul had finished writing all of his. That's what it's believed. In fact, it's believed that perhaps this was written before 2 Timothy was written. Uh, most of Paul's letters were still 15 years old or newer. And some, it's been said, the ink had barely dried. 
But notice, though, what is said here under inspiration by Peter, the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 3, verse 15. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also giving to the wisdom, uh, I'm so also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, written to believers, as also in all his epistles or letters, speaking to them of thing, uh, these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unrest, unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, even unto their own destruction. Notice, all, all was being called scriptures right away. Now, there was no like doubt, like, well, uh, the, you can read heretics and people, especially the Roman Catholic doctrine, will say that the Bible was not compiled till hundreds of years later. And, they, and by the way, they take credit for it. All right. And be careful because they take credit for a lot of stuff. All right. You, you hear people say that they came up with changing, you know, uh, the Sabbath to Sunday. Not true. Uh, that they came up with all of. No, no, no. Any of that stuff, you know, church history. All right. Absolutely not. All right. Oh, they're the ones that compiled the books. And no, 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 no. Not true at all. Notice Paul's epistles already being called scriptures here while Paul is not even finished writing all of them yet. All right. Uh, they were accepted as from God through the apostle basically immediately. All right. And so we should have confidence. New Testament written under inspiration. Number two, the New Testament was completed and sealed. New Testament was completed and sealed. It was called the faith or New Testament faith. And we looked at that in Jude 3. Once delivered unto the saints. That idea of saints has two meanings. First, the prophets, the holy men of God. And second, believers in the church who accepted and received these as from God. Again, every New Testament book is written either by an apostle or a close associate of that apostle firsthand. No one else. And so there was no doubt that these were accepted and received as the very words of God. All right. And very much a lot of times fairly immediately. I mean, even think of this. Think of this. All of these letters in the New Testament would have been handwritten. I mean, how long would a handwritten letter last? If we were here, if we were here today and we're the church of Ephesus and we have the epistle written to us. I mean, how many times do you re read that before it begins to get tattered and faded? Uh, I mean, how often do you, do you think, uh, do you think, again, that goes back to, that's a great future study on the Bible. Well, what about the copies and how do you do that and how do you entrust that and how do you ensure there's no mistakes? And, and we make mistakes, so how can we be sure that what we have today, and, and that's God uh, superintending all things. God is sovereign. You think he's going to just close an eye on that and not understand how that works and how he can trust and all of that. And so you think about the different copies. And then wait a minute. If that copy was not just for the church, but was for all believers, wouldn't they have to make many copies so that every church could have the copy of them? And then you begin to think of, well, yeah, I mean, it, that letter was not just for the, just to be kept just at Philippi. It was for believers. And so you can't just have one copy. And so there has to be multiple copies for churches. And so, again, and when you begin to study all that, it's amazing how many New Testament copies are around today and how they agree on uh, 95 percent or higher with the proper text there in which the King James comes from. It gives you great confidence in the word of God. The scriptures are written under inspiration. They were completed and sealed. All right. Number three, they were received and accepted as God's word by the apostolic churches. That's the key right here. And that's where we get that word canon, C-A-N-O-N. -N. It throws us off because when we hear canon, we're all thinking of the same thing. <laughs> all right. It's not a word we use for anything else. All right. The canon of scripture. All right. But the canon is, is an, a Greek word. It comes from the Greek word of a ruler or a measuring rod or the standard by which we judge if that book is a scripture book. And so when you hear of the canon of the Old Testament or the canon of the New Testament, that's talking about a official standard or rule by which they would determine, is this a book of the Bible inspired of God or not? Please don't think that the devil is not capable of putting out false Bibles and epistles. And so who had to decide that? Is God going to just let that go and think, well, OK, no, no. And so you see God superintending all of this. It's been said the canon is determined by God and recognized by man, determined by God and recognized by man and not just any man. 
all right? Holy men of God, godly believers in that early apostolic church, all right? You say, well, what was the standard? What was the standard if a letter came? They say, look, we have a letter here. It's, it says it's an epistle from Barnabas. Hey, Barnabas is a great man. Or one of the early leaders, one of the first missionaries with Paul. I'm sure Barnabas wrote some stuff. Doesn't mean that what he wrote was all evil and wicked. But hey, we have an epistle from Barnabas. How, is this going to be a book of the Bible? How do we determine that? Do we just say, well, we don't like Barnabas. All right, or you know, him and Paul had a little, you know, or, oh, hey, look, this, this is, we have a letter. It says it's a, a, a gospel of Thomas. Thomas, Thomas is a disciple, right? I mean, that, that's good. I mean, so how do we determine uh, what, uh, just the 27 books of the New Testament? Does God supersede all of that? Can we trust that what we have is enough? Are these men quoting, though, from things that are outside sources that also are inspired? And so that goes down to what we call the canon, the standard. Uh, number one, they would say, what's, does this have a divine source? Does it claim to be from God? Number two, uh, the human source, who's the author? Is they, are, are they an apostle? Are they a close associate of an apostle? And that we have full confidence in who they are in their walk with God. Is, is it authentic? Is it been recognized as one from God? Uh, does it match the rest of Scripture with no contradictions or errors that would go against those kind of things? Was it accepted and received by church leaders as inspired in the Word of God right away toward the beginning? Or was there any doubt and question in that? And... All of that ties in with God's inspiration and preservation of God guiding and superseding over all of that. Uh, we have time for maybe just one verse and we'll have to finish. Go back with me to John 16. John 16. This is a verse you've probably heard and you may even know it by memory, but it doesn't just apply to the very moment it was quoted here to the disciples, although that was proper interpretation hermeneutically. But I, I claim this. I pray this. Lord, guide me. Guide me in all truth. I mean, as a preacher, Lord, I want to make sure I'm preaching straight from the word of God. Lord, if there's anything I've written down or I'm about to say that is not from you, then Lord, keep me from saying it. If I'm not handling the scriptures properly and properly divided, then Lord, show me. Guide me in all truth. Your word is truth. I mean, I believe that God can do that. Do you? And in John 16, 13, what does Christ say here? Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Now, obviously, speaking to the 11 disciples here in the upper room, so that would certainly be the opportunity of, of the actual occasion, but I believe we can certainly apply that in, in, to believers. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. If we believe that the Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible, and he is, and we believe that God inspired every word of the Bible, and, it, and we do. And we believe it's an error, infallible, and it's reliable and sure. Do we not believe that that same God, the same Spirit, guided the leaders to know what are books of the Bible and what are not? Do you believe God just sort of sat back and said, all right, you're on your own here, and they had to guess and choose? All right, no. He guided them and superseded them in all truth so that they would know what are scriptures and what are not, what are fakes, what are counterfeits. And by the way, the majority of the Bible and New Testament was completed and sealed and accepted not long into the second century there. Wow, as this is it, no others. These 27 make up the completed, sealed New Testament books. And that the believer should not have any worry or fear on so-called discoveries. I remember when the book of uh, Judas came out uh, years ago. Oh, my goodness, look at that. It has all kind of things in there that cast doubt on Christ and a relationship you have with Mary Magdalene. I mean, well, should that shake our faith? Should we be in any way be deceived by that? Should we not believe that the devil would do that? Absolutely. That we can have complete confidence in the word of God. I'm going to not get to my final point here. The scripture is preserved and then passed on to next generations. God has many promises. We'll have to get to that next time uh, through the scriptures. That we, After all, why would he tell his disciples and apostles, go ye into all the world, right? Teach all nations, make disciples, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. It has to do with God preserving and passing on so that we can be confident and be sure. So what's the summary? What's the summary here? Jude is not quoting, I believe, at all from the book of Enoch. He's been given this from the Holy Spirit because he didn't know Enoch. All right. And he wasn't around back then. But God, as he's writing that book to warn the early church of apostates.
and false teachers and warning them of men who have crept in unaware gives them that great prophecy from Enoch of the coming of the Lord, the second coming, when he's going to come back with ten thousands of his saints, bringing judgment on all those who do not believe. Wow, what a message that must have been to those back then. And what a message still here today as we hear Enoch in the book of Jude. I trust that you are confident that what we have, the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God for us today. Father, we love you and we love your word. We thank you for what we would call the great miracle of the scriptures, Lord, that you, God breathed every word, every letter of the scriptures. Lord, you have superintended and guided and preserved and protected the whole along the way. Lord, so that what we have today, we can have absolute confidence and trust in. Lord, there's going to be things we read, as we saw, that are hard to understand. There's going to be things that appear to be errors and contradictions from which we will have no answer, humanly speaking. But Lord, the Bible is based on you and your very character. You are God. and You are not a God of error. You know all things. You can do all things. And Lord, you are certainly able to preserve your word so that we can have it today, even among the attacks of the world and the devil. Now, Lord, I pray that we would contend for the faith. Lord, I pray that we would be bold witnesses of the gospel. I pray, Lord, we would rejoice in the church that you designed and you said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And Lord, I pray that we would read your word with confidence and more importantly, we would obey it and live it and practice it on a daily basis until you come. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.